Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sean Bernard. I'm a creative writing faculty member at the University of Laverne, a small school in Southern California. Um, I'm also the Western Region Council Chair of the Association of um, Writers and Writing Programs, um, AWP, of course, representing right here. Um, and a little context for our panel today. Um, at the conference in March of this year, uh, at a breakout session, um, several other program directors and faculty suggested that AWP might uh, provide guidance, um, especially for newer faculty, but for all faculty, for how to best deal with pieces that come into workshops that can be inflammatory. Um, so we've had a few conversations about how to do this, and, and we decided that having this virtual panel would be the best way to, to kind of talk about how to deal with uh, inflammatory workshop pieces. Um, and I reached out to other West Coast program chairs and creative writing faculty. Uh, we're all going to introduce ourselves, and they've been very kind to, to offer to take part in this, and, and we're hoping to help you out um, with future situations that you might encounter in, in difficult workshops. So um, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves, and then we'll get going. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brigitte Sharma. Um, I'm a professor of English at Pomona College uh, in Southern California near Sean, um, and um, I'm delighted to, to be here. Hello, I'm Benita Blackburn, associate professor of fiction at Fresno State. And it's about four hours, I guess, north of where uh, Brigitte and Sean kind of in that, in that area, maybe three hours. And yeah, I'm excited to talk to you guys today. And I'm Elena Passarello. I direct the MFA program at Oregon State University, uh, which Vanita knows how many hours north I am of y'all because oh, you made the drive once. <laughs> 11, 11 hours north. Uh, and I mostly teach nonfiction uh, and nonfiction workshops, but I'm so excited to be here, uh, a part of this Brady Bunch Square with these three writers and educators. Perfect. And, and just to give a little um, description for how this is going to work, we're, we're each going to take turns kind of sharing um, stories about situations we've had in our workshop experiences. Um, and then we'll just have conversations about what, what we thought worked well, things we could have done differently. Um, and, and it'll go from there. And I think uh, Pragita is going to lead things off. So thank you guys all for joining us again. Thanks so much for having me. Um, you know, I, I took all these notes and have all these anecdotes. Um, to think about um, maybe maybe more um, the culture that might create some inflammatory work in the classroom. And I thought maybe that might be a good um, way to kind of usher in um, some of my colleagues here's stories. Um, I, uh, I was teaching in New York for many years and then I moved to uh, University of Montana in 2007, after actually being a visitor there for a year. So I was a faculty member for a year as a sabbatical replacement. And then I applied uh, to be a director of the creative writing program, where I, and I became a director for four years before I rotated after tenure into um, just sort of teaching poetry and managing the poetry wing of things. Um, but I wanted to think about this period of time, the mid to late aughts, um, because I think things were really um, challenging. I mean, they're still challenging for BIPOC faculty, but they were really challenging during that time because I think a lot of pedagogy um, has, has, has changed uh, in the workshop. I wanted to think about the social dynamics in the room and how whiteness, misogyny, and racism worked its way from faculty culture to student culture. Um, it's since changed because of how our discourse is changing. Um, but at that time, I think what was hard to take was that the writing and the strategies and the dynamics, if I could make a generalization, um, were when students um, at the graduate level, I think um, this happened for me, um, mimic the sentiments and the styles of the most powerful faculty. Um, most of whom, um, in my case, were white men and white women. Um, and so um, what I found being reproduced in the classroom was the power dynamics of students deciding who to value, who to mimic, and who to write like. And so when, um, so, so when um, I, for myself, I would think about styles of pedagogy or experimental ways to think about social practice, it was very hard for for um, 
for some students to receive that. Um, and so I, I think my anecdote is, is, is general. Um, but I will say that was the graduate level. And at the undergraduate level, it would simply be um, things where we would have heated discussions um, about, um, about practices that might be in the poem. For example, I remember there being a Confederate flag in a poem, and it was um, it was it was a discussion about um, a, a student actually having one in a window on campus, and um, it it got to the point where I had to call out the class and um, ask them to identify, self-identify, to to actually um, wonder with them who was a person of color in the room and. And, and who did this hurt? And if we were not hurting anyone in the room, what did it say about the whiteness in the room? Um, so what I ended up having to do in the early aughts was do um, more critical race theory and, and talk about aesthetics and critical race theory in ways that, um, that I hadn't expected to. And because my colleagues weren't doing these things in the classroom. Um, so I guess my, my discussion really to, op to maybe to talk about later is to think about what is um, structural in a program where um, students reproduce the power dynamics of faculty. Um, I think maybe that that's enough for now, I hope. That sounds so challenging. Um, gosh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm we're just going to open this up for questions uh, for Pragita, observations. Um, so I'm going to try to step back. But Vanita, Elena, go for it. I thought it was really interesting that we were talking about um, who to mimic. And it's not time for my anecdote, right? I'm just, okay. Yeah. And I, I, I do remember this being a thing for sure. It's been a while since I've been in an, in an MFA program as a student, but I do know that there was this urgency to please professors, to please your teachers. And I do, now that I think about it, yes, I do see, you know, most of my, most of my students, especially undergrads, don't really realize that I do write. <laughs> they, they're just sort of in there. And they, you know, they, they, they're just sort of, yeah, this class seems better than, you know, chemistry or something for the requirements. So they just kind of leaned in. And so I don't have that kind of mimic uh, instinct from them. It, maybe some of the grad students or some of the advanced comp students that have, you know, uh, advanced uh, creative writing students that have been with me longer have read my work. And then maybe I might start to see some echoes of things in, in, their, in their own prose. And it's flattering, sure, but it's not, it's not the common thing. But yes, I do see that mimic of popular fiction, of popular writers, things that are are considered to be more literary, more established, and that does lean into the kind of the canon of white whiteness and maleness, and like we were talking about misogyny. So I could totally see that as a as a thing. But I do feel like my own presence as a person immediately challenges that so as I as I walk into the room on what might be the expectation or what might please me. So I do feel like there might be um, something in that, but. Not to take up the whole the whole discussion. Yeah, just to, to sort of add to that, I, I really I hear very much what where Pradita is coming from, and 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 lived through that because in the early odds, I was a grad student, and that and then uh, about ten years ago, I became a faculty member, and you know I um I always kind of take like a Colombo approach, I think, both as like a student as an, and as an educator. I always saw myself because I came from sort of a state school background and I was uh, I had a different career and profession before I uh, became a writing teacher. I always just sort of assumed that uh, I didn't have a lot of power uh, as a workshop leader or that or that my power wasn't necessarily uh, something that um, I needed to grapple with when I was putting together a, a course situation. And I think in the first few years that I started leading workshops, particularly graduate workshops, because like Vanita said at my school, I don't think my undergraduates really know. I think they, they I think they think that I could very easily be a gym teacher or maybe I wrote mm -hmm. something, but they're just glad that I tell a lot of jokes in class. But on the graduate level and in other forms of teaching, I really had to sort of um, come to terms with the fact that there was a power structure that I needed to make sure that I decentered 
and dismantled, despite the fact that I felt like uh, Peter Falk in a trench coat, kind of like bumbling her way through um, classes. Um, it also makes me think about a way of talking that was a part of both my education and maybe unfortunately my early teaching, which was this, this word, the U word, universality. I think sometimes when I spoke in craft perspectives and when I learned certainly in craft perspectives, people talk to me about achieving universal resonance or um, a kind of shared understanding of an aesthetic gesture or of a pop culture reference or a value system. Uh, and I think the majority of the people who taught me universality as a craft goal uh, looked like me uh, and uh, you know, were cis head folks like me. So um, I think another thing that in over the course of my 10 years teaching, I've had to kind of grapple with is this idea that um, I need to create a classroom that doesn't understand universality as a universal concept, that the, the universe is not necessarily a definable thing, even among 10 people who are all in the same place at the same time, uh, trying to achieve relatively similar goals uh, as MFA writers. Frigida, I'm tempted to, to jump to the end and just say, how'd you fix it? Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll cover that, but that just, I just want to say like, that sounds so amazingly difficult because I mean, you're, you're talking about a structure, right? I mean, you're talking about institutional structure, institutional culture, um, regional culture, I'm sure as well. And, and that's, that's something that I've been lucky that I don't have to, to address here um, where I teach, but I mean, <laughs> Also, you were by yourself in some ways, right? Like, I mean, trying to trying to work against like this kind of dominant culture. Were there things that you found effective, um, at least with like the students, if not with other faculty? Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, I think um, I, I think one advantage we have when we're in leadership roles is to really um, initiate um, searches uh, to to think about what the what the faculty and the students need. Um, and then to think about the classroom. I think what what I did was I did risky things. I developed um, uh, exercises after Peggy McIntosh's unpacking the invisible knapsack around advantages and disadvantages and brought them into the workshop. It made students uncomfortable because I think they, I, I wanted to think about how do we share content? How do we talk about power explicitly? But it was risky because I didn't have tenure yet. And it was very weird to be a director of a program without tenure. Um, and I think that that is something to talk about is how do we, how do we create the classroom that we want um, and that we need in order to teach um, effectively and to change the consciousness of the room um, without tenure, if you're in a place that doesn't value, um, that's not in the 21st century, which is what I was realizing at that time, it has since changed a lot. But I think lots of us recognize that we've been um, part of the change and we've sacrificed a lot um, to make change. Um, but I, so I, I, I think, um, I think in terms of solving, it, it was time and um, a, sort of a, a shift in visibility of who is, is where and who's in the room. I think that point about uh, tenure, these invisible forces that restrain and restrict and that, you know, um, have a have a say in what we say uh, are really important to sort of bring up. And also in this modern context of not just tenure, not just what you say in the classroom that might be coming back to you or what you say amongst your peers, it's what you say in the public sphere, all of these other voices and, and opinions that happen that can, you know, change and and misconstrue what you what your intentions are in the in the digital realm. All of that has an effect on your on your persona and your perception of um, how you are perceived by your by your department. Just another layer of constriction, and primarily too for women, you know, and for and for people of color. I do feel that the and also the studies show that that those are the ones that are most targeted and most um, um, scrutinized for the things we say. Uh, publicly, privately, and you know, of course, in the classroom too. 
and, and let me know when it's time for my anecdote. I just start to flap. I don't know. I don't, I don't think about schedules and itineraries all that often. But, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll keep going. And this is really fascinating. I don't I don't think about the articulation of these of these problems of these circumstances as much as I sort of just navigate them through through teaching and through experiences and kind of just sort of modifying in a state constant state of modification and I think that's healthy for teachers uh, for healthy for everyone as long as you realize that what you did yesterday might not work today but I do know that I don't I don't encounter the inflammatory student as often as I I run into the inflammatory environment, like Brigitte was saying, uh, where one, where a student might feel somewhat um, attacked or dismissed, and that was more common, I think, for for me. And those students were always the ones that were in a minority for some reason, not necessarily racially, but for sure racially, or it could be gender, it could be sexuality, it could be all of these other things that would that where they did not feel that they belonged in the common sort of um, group of what of what the material should be, what the material should look like, what was going to be funny to this group. They sort of recognize their audience, which is actually a really good, you know, first step as a <laughs> as a writer. But there was this pressure, this 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 perception that they were not being uh, equally received or because of because of you know their identities. And I did have one woman that came to me many, many years ago. Well, um, not that long ago, not that old, but yes, it was many years ago in a different state, different school. And she she had me as a student. And it's it's also, and this was a black woman, and it's also not common to have your first creative writing teacher be a black woman when you are a black woman. That was not my experience at all for, um, for as, a, as an undergrad, as a, as a new student. I think I was well into my, into my grad program when I went to a different side uh, organization, it was called Bona, where I actually was taught for the first time by a black woman in my in my uh, creative writing experience. And that was really, really, you know, a, an interesting thing to have happened. And it feels like a small thing when when uh, probably for for other people that are have had this thing where you already immediately have a kind of camaraderie, a sense of, you know, a belonging and, and knowing that happens between you and the faculty. That is not always the, 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 you know, the case for a long time for a lot of people. And so this, this student came to me after she'd had my class, and it was, you know, another you know, couple years later, and she'd been taking other classes by other different you know, faculty and realized that it was a completely different experience, that the, the classroom environment was different. And it was because she didn't feel like her work um, had the merit there that it did when she was with me. And I said, well, and it, at the time, I said, "Well, that's part of the deal," and I was thinking, "Well, that's that's it was a common she did she just didn't have the normal experience like I did, where you walk in and yes, you have to sort of convince people that your work has merit later on, or you have to be either born like me with this extraordinary level of self of self esteem, and um, where if someone doesn't like your work, you're sort of just more shocked than than devastated personally. You're sort of like, "What's your problem? How can you not love what just happened to you?" And on the page, but that of course later on you start to you know you have to you know tamp tamp down that ego, and tamp down and sort of reach a different kind of level of humility. Most people are not me. Most people don't have that, and most people that are you know in the minority class for whatever reason don't have that either. So I realized that at the time. And so my solution was to actually create a whole different you know program. So I started the Live Right uh, organization where I would teach workshops to communities of color on the weekend just for, for me, for kicks and giggles, but just to help, you know, sort of make sure that other people that wanted access to a kind of friendly environment, a more, you know, accepting environment where you don't have to immediately try to convince someone that your experiences, that writing about regions and, and voices that are so vastly different than the, than the majority um, is worthwhile. So I did that, but that is not the solution, I think, for a lot of people because, and also, you know, we have limited on, on time and resources. I think if anything, it's to it's to remember, it's to recognize, it's to create a, create a self awareness of others, to recognize whatever the majority might be in the group, whether it's racially, sexually, um, you know, gender, all of these other kinds of things, faith based. Maybe you have a student that does not immediately have, you know, 
that, that does not have share the faith of most, recognizing that there might be someone that would be othered. And not to sort of hone in on that person and sort of, you know, give them, you know, every, every, you know, trophy and award for it, but to remind the group of this condition, not that specific, you know, one for the suitor, but the condition that we have to remember that all experiences are the point, that we're writing about humanity in total. We're not writing just to please whatever the majority expects. It's to, you know, expand the expand the expectations to remember how, how the range of, of our existence and our species. If anything, just keeping that in mind when approaching a group might be helpful. I have other rules too that I was given as an undergraduate that I carry on into my classes. We can talk about that later too. But I'll stop there for now. I don't know how long I've been laughing at this point. Well, that's fantastic, Vanita. Thanks. Um, just a quick side observation. I mean, I think both both you and Prakita are, are sort of proving the point, right? That the burden of doing the extra work is falling on faculty of color, um, female faculty, right? Because like the normal setting is privileging, right? The privilege, so um, yeah, it's terrible. Um, questions, comments, Elena, Pragita? Maybe, uh, I wonder, Vanita, do you notice any difference in terms of what you're talking about right now in grad versus undergrad versus non, let's say non-academically affiliated, like a, uh, like something like like you're talking about with Vona or something like uh, or like you know we both teach at the Swanee Writers Conference which is a, a two week uh, you know you just meet them and then you start workshopping thing uh, does the approach or does your experience differ between those sectors? They absolutely differ between those sectors. You know every all of, especially for something like Swanee it's so carefully curated right you know the people just the students that come in. You know, their work is, you know, read thoroughly by multiple people to sort of make sure that it's not going to be, you know, inflammatory, that it's, it is something that could be, you know, that needs work. Yes. But also the person and the content is something that they do want to sort of, you know, keep um, nurturing and, and, and sort of, you know, feeling, feeling out in a way that will help that student. If you're in the normal undergraduate class, you get anybody. It's just any anything will fall out of the ceiling into the seats, and you're just you know you know you, here you are, <laughs> and they don't know what to expect. You you know you don't know what to expect, and that's it's exciting, and that's part of the fun. When I talk about you know humanity, you know you want that. You want the big range. You want to sort of get all the perspectives. And I've taught in various um, regions where uh, you get different political ex you know expectations and, and all of that. And also uh, teaching and coming from uh, my own you know, political perspectives that it, that's, you know, very kind of, you know, it's not it's not in the middle by any means, you know, now, but it definitely does not, you know, lean on each of the, the, the even even sides. So they, uh, you come into all of all of that and have to navigate it. And then they and then they have to read work from other other students and, and you know, have that have that conversation. It's a mess. And I know that's why we're having this whole this whole thing trying to figure out how do we fix this and we are all, we're also in such an inflammatory time period that i think is very new so i've been alive for i'll let you know my, my age i've been alive for 39 years in america and i've never quite felt this level of weirdness and tension and hostility even in the academic environments which you which you were supposed to be sort of soft and and you know and, and cozy and at least to some degree trying to you know pretend to be diplomatic <laughs> So, and it's it's been weird, and it's been weird for about five ish years, I think, in a in a very in a very you know obvious sort of way. But going back, but at the same time, I do feel that there's this pressure now to be to be much more kind than they used to be, as as you know, in these workshop environments. You know, there was this trend of being the the, the jerk, the you know the teacher that is you know you know throwing throwing you know your poems or your your stories you know, in the garbage right in front of you just to make you feel that, you know, I don't know what they want you to feel. What, what was that? It's usually in front of sort of man or certain kind. You know, what was the point of that? Of course, it's just ego. So it's insecurity. It's this, you know, performance of, of a power or something. And it's just stupid. It was, it was really stupid. It, and it did more damage than good, I think, for a lot of people, especially for the people that, that needed to, re to be told their thoughts and their ideas are important, and of all those people that had really important, you know, I, the, even even my my MFA program, that I think the most talented person that was there gave up. She doesn't write anymore. But also, they started having babies, and that the judge changes everything. 
<laughs> but and it's it's that kind of thing that that will happen when you have those people. We don't have as many of those people anymore. So so I love that that, that those times have changed and, the, and those environments have changed. But but yeah, uh, uh, Anita, thank thank you. Um, I I was thinking about how you had. Um, thought about your own experience of being taught by someone who looks like you later in life and not earlier. Um, and I wondered if you found when you were teaching your student and you were developing those workshops outside of the institution or with other institutions, um, did you feel you had to code switch um, or reflect on what the strategies were in those spaces? Um, have they since come together or things? I, I don't know. I was just interested in because I, I, I've yet to study with a South Asian poet. And I'm, I always wonder what it would have been like. Now I'm 50 and, um, you know, I, I feel like I have uh, communities where, where I learn from, um, from elders, et cetera. But, but I, I and and so I've made a point to also um, connect with South Asian students and BIPOC students in a particular way that that feels meaningful to my own, you know, um, journey. I, I wondered, you know, sorry, I, I'm just wondering the same for you, and you know, just your thoughts. Um, there's a lot of thoughts there. And yes, there are no real <laughs> questions, but they're they were trying to be questions. No, and I, I think it's wonderful that you are you're becoming the person that you needed you know, back then. And I think that's that's part of the, the duty. That's part of the artistic kind of um, obligation if you take on the educator role, right? It's, you know, it's, it's to, to keep sort of, you know, giving back what you didn't have more than you, more than you got, or just, just a little bit. So I think that's, I think that's wonderful. I think that's, that's really beautiful. And that's not at all to what I said earlier about not having, you know, a black woman as my first teacher. I was really, really lucky because my first creative writing teacher, my, my official one was Amy Bender. And she was like, amazing. And <laughs> Amazing on all kinds of levels, just as a teacher, but also, of course, as a writer. And def definitely, you know, I, I as that in the in the early stages, I didn't read, you know, I didn't read any old work for a long time. So we had a bunch of classes together before I even realized that she was that talented. And then maybe some of the mimicking started happening you know, later on. But I was really fortunate still to have that, that you know, really that skill and all of that. But there was still that that separation, that separation of you know content and experience. But she also taught me a lot about teaching, about recognizing. And encouraging in you know, everyone that had there's something something good in everything, and she was she was able to sort of do that. So I was I was really fortunate because I had to take that perspective and, and spread it off into into the the other elements of identity that were that were interesting to me that I also saw being neglected as a as a student as a writer later on as well. I don't know if I answered everything or, or touched on everything, but but definitely I I, I agree. With um, really quickly, I just want something you said really resonated with me, Benita. Um, I mean, it's like when you're talking about the political divide, right? That can even occur in the classroom, right? Um, and I, you sort of intimated this. Like, I, I try to tell my students, like, in in the creative writing classroom, we're not on sides. There's no political. We're on the side of literature, right? We're on the side of good, empathetic, human, right? Like complex, challenging, difficult life, right? Um, and and I think that that helps kind of diminish. Um, political ideologies, at least in my classroom. So I, yeah, I mean the literature, right, and the the empathy of literature is, is what's important. But um. I love that. It does get to be tricky though too, because I always tell my my students. I don't always tell, but I'm sorry to mention this that you want unhealthy people on your pages as as a fiction writer. So we don't we don't really want to read about everyone that has their life together. They're all balanced. They never lose their keys. They're always on time. They're um, and they're and they're always they're, they're fun and they're, and they're and they're happy and they eat well. We don't want that. As you know, we want the characters that are a total mess that make bad decisions that we actually don't like sometimes, but we still want to watch them. But you want your you want your your connecting voice to actually be a little bit healthier. But you want the the you want the the guide, you want the manuscript, you want the book to be healthy, to have a healthy balance of things or harmony of things. I don't know if I believe in balance that much anymore these days, but if there's you want that to be the container for sure. But it's messy inside. And you do have to sort of go into dangerous, you know, you know, um, inappropriate, uncomfortable directions just to be honest about who we are. And it's and we have to keep reminding the students that even when we reach those things, we have to challenge it as, as if we're you know are we perpetuating this idea or are we just examining it? Are we presenting it? 
what are we doing here when we do reach those conflicts and those and those uncomfortable moments? But just not, and also asking questions, I feel as a, as an instructor is is really a healthy approach too, to not be didactic, to remember that we are investigating as much as we are um, instructing. I started thinking about, I don't know if you guys remember this, um, I think in the 90s, late 90s, maybe there was like the, the fear of the workshop story, like like everybody was writing this kind of like paint by numbers, like kind of basic story that was being ingrained by everybody who went to Iowa and basically every workshop, I think, right? Um, and I don't, I think that's gone away ha happily, right? I mean, the fear of it and also just the awareness that such a thing may or may not exist, which I don't think it ever really did exist, but, um, but my students, like I just try to encourage them to to write about their cultures, their subcultures, especially when they're not from the dominant or whatever, the hierarchical culture, because we all like to read new stories, right? I mean, like like the, the other stories like you're saying, like we've all read these stories, right? Um, we don't need to write, read these same stories over and over and over. I mean, they, I encourage them to dive into their experiences because their experiences are things that readers like, just want to read about, right? I mean, we want to read things we don't know that, that are new to us. I think that's that's a fundamental aspect to, to reading and, and it's an easy way to encourage students um, to lean into that in their own writing and then to like embrace them in the classroom, right? To make their voices matter and their backgrounds matter, right? Because like that's what matters in literature too, so um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll just kind of, uh, uh, I'm thinking so many new things now uh, versus the things that I wanted to say. Uh, I, I just wanted to kind of like keep going with this thing that Vanita brought up that I really think gets to the core of the way that I've been rethinking workshops for, I don't know, prob probably the past like seven years or so. Um, and it's, it's, it's this, this thing that I have decided is a problem. I don't know if it's a problem or not, but uh, I think we, me, a lot of people, this idea of the harsh workshop that Sean was talking or Vanita was talking about with the trash can and the, the professor who like, I remember like my second creative writing class when I was 19 years old, somebody, my, my professor who had gone to Iowa talking about in the 70s, somebody coming in, one of their peers coming in and taking a piece of paper and setting it on fire, you know, <laughs> whatever. And uh, we all were like, whoa, that's what writing is. And, and, and this is in television. This is in um, certainly a lot of institutions, this idea of workshop as this gauntlet. And I, I see a lot of effects of it. Um, one of the things I see is, you know, students still say things like, I can take it. I can take whatever you want to say. I can take it. You go ahead. I want you to be as harsh as possible. Uh, or you see students say things like, well, my workshop hated that piece. Right, which is a milder sort of interpretation of this kind of schema that we've set up for what workshop is, or like workshop didn't like it, right? Or um, uh, I'm gonna get ripped apart in workshop today. You know, these, these sorts of things that for me speak to, I mean, some of them are more literally inflammatory than others. Um, but I think what it boils down to is a difference in the understanding of workshop and peer review. I think the past like seven years ish of my career, I've been trying to make a space between the idea of a peer encountering a piece that you made and then providing their feedback and this other thing that maybe a workshop could be, you know, like, um, like what, what would it mean if your role as, like, like I say to my students, like I think the least helpful day of my work, workshop class should be the day that your piece is up. What would it mean if you learned more from talking about other people's work than if you talked about your own or if you heard people talk about your own? Um, what would it mean? So which of course is you, you say that to them and then everybody just kind of goes right back to being like, I hope I don't get ripped apart in workshop or I hope I do get worked apart in workshop, workshop. So then I had to think about how to like actually achieve that. Um, and uh, some of the things that I've been practicing uh, have been, oh, I mean, I've been kind of like ripping the whole thing apart, like for undergraduates, um, well, I mean, for both undergraduates and grad students, I think I think the, the, the thing, one thing that I've, I've been trying to do with every class is 
the class builds a vocabulary before they be begin speaking about each other's work. So we learn how to talk to each other about writing and we learn how other people talk about their own writing so that when it comes time to talk about your peers' writing, you can use a language that's sort of agreed upon or, or shared by the group in whatever time constraints you have. Uh, I can't remember if it was Vanita or Purdue who talked about asking questions. Maybe it was Vanita. Um, uh, me asking questions and then repeating back the question. This is all very Columbo now that I think about it. Maybe, I think Pierre Fock and Columbo have completely influenced my, but like, can you say that one more time? Can you say that again? You know, uh, and then they use these words and some of them are really silly, like write aboutable or grilled cheese or whatever. And we write them on the board and we retain them over the course of the term. We have ways of talking about not product, but process and making, right? Um, I think that those that that is one small step, um, and there are a million others, but maybe I won't talk too much about anymore unless the conversation goes that way, of asking the students to maybe not see the day that they put their, see this kind of exchange, I guess, see this kind of transactional um, thumbs up, thumbs down, Yelp kind of way of looking at what a workshop could be, because in other contexts, the word workshop means making, right? It means... It means being being in a place with like a winch and a saw or some stuff. I don't even know, but like, it's about the, it's about the process of putting something together. It's not about the product of making something. Um, and maybe one, just one more. The thing that I was gonna sort of talk about was just the sort of added kind of hiccups when it comes to teaching a nonfiction workshop, which it isn't always the case, but quite frequently the 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 projects that people are working on involve an I, and that I is arguably the same self, more or less, that's in the room. Um, when I hear Vanita talking about, and Sean talking about writing about experiences and fiction, obviously that same kind of dynamic is there, right? Somebody coming from a specific cultural background or, or any kind of background and then writing characters that are not themselves, but still are bringing those experiences into the room. But there's something about kind of like, whatever the, the gauzy curtain of fiction, right, allows, like that's kind of lifted when people are writing like personal essays or memoir or something like that. So um, there's, there's an added kind of uh, reason to avoid that transactional vocabulary, that product-based vocabulary and to um, uh, kind of build effective models of communication so that the person who's sitting there talking about experiences that they had, presenting them in this literature of witness, uh, doesn't feel like people are judging the experiences that they've had or the way that they maneuvered or, or have worked through those experiences that they're looking you know, at the craft. So that's like a big kind of potential inflammatory situation in nonfiction, um, but that's enough talking. So I think I'll stop and um, I can't see any of you guys right now. I just like, I'm just staring at, okay, good. Hi, okay, you're back. <laughs> I felt so alone. <laughs> it is weird in there when you're suddenly just talking to yourself. You're like, and you can't, yeah, you're like, all right, I don't know if they're listening. Like, I don't know what I'm I don't, I'm trying not to look at the screen. So I'm just kind of like staring at the green light. Like, I feel like I'm like, you know, I don't know. Anyway, that's a, that's a different panel that we need to have about, <laughs> about that. <laughs> I, I, I love thinking about how workshop has changed so much from, you know, the, the silent um, listener. Um, I, I don't use that model anymore because you know it's it's it can be so shaming in poetry for everyone to talk about you while you're in the room and you can direct the you know the the class to the questions you have. Um, so we we've done away with with some of the the, the Iowa model um, and. Also, yeah, I was just thank you, Vanita and Elena and Sean, because it's just fun to think about um, what is what what do we see as progress for um, for the workshop shop in the last and and the change in the last five years. Uh, it, so I've been enjoying um, that we're actively engaged in a kind of change. Uh, I don't I see. I'm not asking questions, but I'm just thinking a lot with you. I have to say, Pradita, uh, that a poet was like the the kickoff for me. In like 2014, we were driving from Corvallis to Portland and she was like, you know what I see workshop as? 
uh, it's just like, look what I made this week. What is it? Yeah. And it was just like, because, you know, in the workshops that I grew up in, it was like, look what I slaved over for the past two months. And I picked the perfect font and I've gotten it as close as I can as possible. Please don't murder me. I'm giving it to you. You can see, my, you know, but this idea of like, I'm trying to figure something out in this very immediate space of making, um, uh, describe it back to me, right? Take, come, come into this place with me and, 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 and see what I'm making while I'm making it. And let's talk from within that. I mean, that was like, I have to give credit to Karen Holmberg and, and all poets for that energy because it was really just revolutionary for me. Yeah, it's a really healthy way to approach you know, your life more so, not as a, a, from a point of fear, but a point of you know, inquiry. What did I make? What is the and also your your strategy, Elaine, it's a testament to your your skill as a teacher, the whole Columbo approach where you're sort of, you know, the the bumbling kind of detective who knows everything, can map out the entire situation, has the solution, knows the killer, knows everything, but sort of like, oh maybe. And then you know, what what about that? And you know, you that that makes people more comfortable with you, it makes them feel more confident, makes them feel like they they have some agency in this in this process of understanding the story and that makes them more comfortable in the classroom and the whole experience becomes much more fun so so I, I, it is it is a, a really great strategy i can only do it so much because like i said my ego is deeply inflated so before i just have to say well actually this is what <laughs> but it, but most of the time i do sort of pretend that yeah what what was this what is the thing in here and i always start with questions but I do want to mention um, one book. We haven't talked about it yet, but it's called Craft in the Real World, Rethinking Fiction Writing and Workshopping by Matthew Salasins. Mm-hmm. And I have not read it, but I have heard amazing things. I know I, I, I went to a, a, I visited a, a class and the entire class had been reading the book and, and doing all of their different workshops based on that. And there was one form where it's called, I don't know if it's the fish bowl or something, but it's where the student sits in the middle and no one gets to tell any, to say anything, but the student asks questions of everyone that read the work. It just kind of goes around the room doing that, sort of interrogating the people that read the work instead of sort of feeling like they've been examined. I thought that was a really good, cool one. I kind of want to try that one day, but that's all I've got for that. I, I also like sort of the, uh, the, the the great couple to the Celestis, the anti-racist writing workshop by Felicia Rose Chavez, which is also all about that kind of decentering or recentering, uh, putting the writer in the middle of the room in a way that sort of actualizes uh, their process, their experiences, et cetera. I think both those books were really helpful for me. Yeah. We, we mentioned Iowa a couple of times. I just wanted to share, um, this is not my anecdote. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I went there and I had a, a professor who famously would tear people's stories in half and throw it at the beginning. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Um, so that was, I, I got to experience that firsthand. I mean, it happened to me. So um, the way I use that now is I tell my students, I, like I tell them like why we have the workshop format that we have, um, it's to avoid that, right? Um, I ask them to, to not think of it as like a competition between the readers and the writer, right? Um, I ask them as writers, we're starting workshop next week. We usually start reading like external texts first and then, then we kind of shift into workshops. So, so we were talking this week about what, how to get ready for workshop. And, and I asked them to just remember the point of workshop as you guys said already is to get feedback, right? It's not to win. It's not to like impress everybody and to like have the best piece. It's to get feedback so you can make the story better, right? I mean, and so once they kind of shift that kind of way of thinking, um, it lessens the pressure, I think, on everybody because they're not trying to like impress anyone. They're just trying to make their stories better, right? Um, and I also stress to them that they're writing in a very short frame of time, especially at the undergraduate level, right? Like it's, we're already under these kind of external false um, pressures of timelines and, you know, meeting and, and, and like, yeah, we're just working on something, play with it, have fun, get some fun feedback and, and go from there, which I think makes it a little bit easier for them. And then during the first workshop, I, and I haven't done this yet, I'll do it on Monday. Um, I jokingly say, uh, I said, all right, um, when we're done talking about the story today, I'm going to ask you all to give them a score and we'll decide which one's the best. And then they all like pale and like their eyes get big. And I'm like, just kidding. No, we would never do that. So I just like make fun of that whole notion. And, and that also like, once, once I say that, they're like, that's crazy, because it is crazy. Um, and that's the way workshops used to be almost, right, in a way, which is nuts. Um, so I think that just like, I don't know, relieves a lot of the pressure. Um, and 
and it also makes everybody more trusting of each other too. Um, and I think just that the shift in workshop itself, which I think is what we're more talking about than anything, takes down the the the, the chance of anybody being inflamed, right? We're all looking at these things as like, uh, maybe somebody writes something offensive unintentionally um, or intentionally, but let's talk about how it's working, not working, um, right? And, and it's process and, and rather than getting um, our backs up, I, th I think in class more, we we think about how it could be better and the author should be aware of those things. I don't know, it becomes much more of a larger conversation. I kind of veered off there, I'll be quiet for a second. <laughs> No, all of that is cool. Are we going to get your anecdote, Sean? Or are we going to keep? Sure, um, and I'll I'll try to keep it fairly brief here. Um, so this is a this is like a very specific situation um, that happened in the last few years. I'm, I'm going to try to be vague about it. Uh, so I teach at a, an HSI Hispanic Serving Institution. Um, most of the students, especially in the creative writing program, um, are Latinx. Uh, most of the students are female. Um, like, I mean, by most, I'm, I'm talking in terms of um, female and, and, and non-binary students. Actually, that's like 90, 95% of the students. Um, so there's very few male students in the program, um, very few white male students in the program. Uh, and most of the students are local Los Angeles area, um, you know, from fairly diverse communities. Um, but every now and then we'll get some students from other communities. and, and so a couple of years ago, uh, a student turned into a workshop. Um, well, the student was from a rural community closer to Uvanita, uh, Central Valley, um, and and I think had a, a more religious upbringing, uh, more conservative upbringing. Um, I think probably has feelings of, of persecution from you know general culture changes at large over the last few years, um, and and turned into workshop a story that was. Uh, supposed to be a satire of liberal media, right? Um, and the student posted the story on our LMS. We use Blackboard. Um, and the student, when the student posted the story for workshop, uh, he added a note that said, and here's the, the fun part, um, it basically said, I know that this is going to offend some of you. I'm glad that it does, or I'm glad that it will. Uh, that set off a lot of alarms. Um, I got tons of emails from other students. Um, and this student who posted the story, posted the comment, was was relatively new to the program. Um, there was kind of a pre-existing culture of everybody got along. We had this great community. Um, so so that set off a lot of alarms. And and what I had to do for the next 48 hours was, was try to figure out how to deal with it in the workshop setting itself and how to, I don't know, um, like deal with it immediately. Uh, so just really quickly, I, I shut down the LMS because I didn't want people to post comments and reply to his comment. I took his comment down. Um, I feel like removing virtual conversations and keeping the conversation in the classroom um, is very helpful. Uh, I mean, you guys know, everybody knows this, right? If you see like offensive things on Twitter um, or email or text, like it just sits with you, right? It's there like kind of yelling at you and you can go back and look at it again and again and again and you kind of can't get your mind around it. Um, so by taking that down, I think I, I lessened a little bit of the, the anger and frustration that a lot of people were feeling. Um, and then the, the hard part for me, and it was a challenging situation because luckily it, it doesn't happen too much. Um, the hard part for me was, was trying to think about how to, you know, not turn it into a teaching moment, but, but to make it positive in some ways. Uh, and, and I think mostly long story short, what I ended up doing was um, I communicated with everyone in class in advance of the workshop. I said that, that if anybody felt that it was too problematic, too offensive, as I say with all stories that are workshopped or anything we read from external texts, um, they they could excuse themselves. I mean, that's that's a standing policy, so that was no different. Um, and so that was easy. So I gave people a chance to leave, basically, uh, in, in quiet protest. Um, but I asked them to stay. And in, when workshop came around, I what I did first was I talked about how we're part of a community, not just of that day in the classroom and not just of that semester of that class, but we're, it's a four year program. Um, students are going to keep taking classes with one another. Uh, their works in process, as we were talking about, um, and, and to keep that in mind, right? Like it's something can be inflammatory, um, but you also can sort of try to keep from being inflamed yourself, right? And you can kind of take the long view. So I asked the students to try to take the long view um, for one thing. And then the second thing, I just asked them to rem remember that the author 
for better or for worse, um, I mean, regardless of the content matter of the story, he was trusting us, right? I mean, he was actually trusting the rest of them to give him feedback on it. Um, like that was his mindset. Like he actually, I mean, aside from the offensive comment, which he did apologize for, which was very helpful. Um, aside from, from, yeah, the thing that he posted with the story, um, he, he had made a gesture of like, here's my story. I know you guys are going to give me feedback on it. And I just reminded them that, that he was trusting them and that, that it was their duty, right? Uh, in a way to give him critical craft feedback. So we had a good workshop. It ended up being um, not positive, but none of the workshops are necessarily positive. It was constructive. I asked them to be um, generous and constructive all the time. That's that's kind of like my default setting for workshop classes. Um, we're never trying to be negative or overly critical, um, but just kind of talking about ways that the pieces can be better. So that was the conversation we had. Occasionally, because of the subject matter, some students wanted to get into the author's motives, and and I was it was easy to diffuse that because I just reminded them that we don't talk about motives, right? Um, like that's not something we do when we're reading. I don't know any of the published works. I've got a bunch of books here next to me, um, or or student works, right? We don't we don't get into motives. We just talk about the the piece itself, um, and then we talk about how it's working and, and maybe how it can be better. Um, if an author wants to talk about motives, they're welcome to, but we're not allowed to like quiz them. Um, so that also took motive and, and kind of the politics out of the classroom. Um, and then we ended by reading another satirical piece, um, just to have a model of satire. We read a uh, Harrison Bergeron, um, a Kurt Vonnegut story. Um, and I think by bringing out, a, bringing in an external piece, like literally I read it out loud at the end of class and we just looked at it on the, on the overhead projector. Um, I, I think having my voice be a little bit more dominant at the end. We usually I'm not very dominant at all in workshop, um, but but having that kind of settled the room, settled the tone, we had an external text. Um, and, and I don't know, I think people left the class that day feeling like it was gonna be a really hard, difficult, big, loud situation where there would be a lot of animosity. And I think everybody felt like, oh, that was okay. That wasn't that wasn't bad at all. In fact, and we learned a little bit about satire, and I think that the author got a lot out of it. His his revision for better or for worse was great. <laughs> he wrote a really good revision um, for the piece, um, and and stayed in the program, still taking classes, and, and the students I think have. I don't know if it's uh, they got along better, um, but but there's a mutual respect there because they trust each other and they're part of a community that they know is going to keep going forward. So that that's kind of how I dealt with that, but. John, it sounds like you created trust in the classroom, which I think is so important and um, it ends up being the thing that either can sink a community or really strengthen a community. Um, and I, you know, that's, a, I think, an interesting theme to talk about is how how the classroom or the institution or the, or the community creates trust. Yeah, I agree. I think you did a great job of handling that whole situation. Yeah, because <laughs> that, is, that is difficult. I thought what, what was really, really smart and effective was to bring it back into the real world and get it off of the digital spaces where people can forget that we are all here and that we all have bodies and we all are still sharing this world and we're not just sort of abstract things that we can um, torment in the darkness. And, and sort of walk away unscathed by it. But you need to be able to look into the eyes of the people that you that you want to attack if this is the if this is the intention. So I think, or, or if you want to remember that these are not just, you know, like I said, ideas that you're attacking. These are whole, whole people with hearts and futures and destinies and pasts that you might need to evaluate and sort of have your own and do some self-reflection in the process. So I thought that, you know, bringing it into that space was really smart. And the way you handled it there was really effective as well. But also, I won't talk about motives just briefly. That I know you wanted to, so you don't talk about motives in the in the classroom, and that's probably smart to keep the thing on tar <coughs> target. But also, that the motive of that student could be interesting, though. If they are trying to simply uh, weaponize an idea or terrorize their peers with something that they know would be painful to read, that's hard. So I do give students a way out for that. So if they want to just, you know, they they want to be exempted from discussion or doing or doing a write up for this, the story itself. They just have to give something to me. They have to give me a, a reason and a write-up on, on for something else. And they can, it'll be a way out so they don't have to sort of engage with really um, disturbing content. Um, before, and I know the reason behind that. So I do have that as part of my, my own process. It's very rare that it has to come up 
and I don't even you know make them do trigger warnings or anything like that. I just sort of tell them that we're talking about people, which is a trigger warning. It's all in there, you know, from from the start. So anything can possibly happen, but I, they, they do have the option too to sort of offer some some kind of a um, kind of preview, a preface to what what will be in the work. There's a craft framework too to the choices that Sean made, which it doesn't solve every issue, but um, I think it is it is it is important when you're dealing with these situations to have that vocabulary, right? Because comedy, even even insult comedy is a craft, satire is a craft, horror is a craft, erotica is a craft, all of these uh situations in which material might have kind of a hotter temperature for the sake of heat or, or we might receive it that way as people who read erotica or, or horror or watch comedy like when in the room it's there's a lot of nuts and bolts things that happen in order to make those choices successful and just like a desire to offend people is like no no comedian can successfully do that straight from desire right or like you know, like if you want to, if you want to tell a, a, a joke that's um, risky, it still has to be a joke that's crafted in an innovative and surprising way, right? We could talk about a few Netflix comedians who are under fire right now for thinking that they have the right to tell whatever jokes they want to tell, but they're not even like thoughtful jokes. And I think that 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 is in that's increased even further if a certain a person that represents a certain background is making a comment on a person that, or on a group of people that they do not represent. Like that's like, I think so in, in general, I think that like, like putting this, uh, an example of published satire out there, thinking about the tenets of satire and what we want and thinking about the stakes of these choices up against craft is, um, it doesn't work for everything, right? Feelings are still feelings. You don't want to turn into like teacher robot and like, just be like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to focus on the craft. Um, uh, but I think in general, like that, like doing it that way shows that, that this is a professional uh, obligation as well as an empathetic human obligation. Uh, yeah. I love that. And, and yeah, sort of shape, shaping it into the, into the craft perspective is, is really important, but also audience, right? Knowing, you know, who, who are you writing for? I always tell my students, you're writing for yourself first, and then you're writing to be understood by others. So if you're writing just to offend your audience, you haven't really accomplished anything at that point. And also think about modern, you know, comedians. I think a lot of them have just, you know, collected too many checks and they've forgotten who they're writing to now, even, you know, you're not writing to an audience of 1995. For a lot of these people, you're writing to a modern audience. You're writing, you know, to try to entertain or challenge or, or you know, something there, and they miss the point. They 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 sort of lost it. So you have to show, sort of give the yeah, give the students that choice. Do you want to be that guy, or do you want to, or do you want to yeah have a have something that's a little bit more substantial and can actually change a mind? Are you trying to sort of you know educate as well as entertain, or are you just trying to be caustic and and damaging? Or, or you know, and get the smallest, the smallest degree of sort of feelings and agitation out of your out of your your reader, and that's it. Is that enough? Are you satisfied yes. with that? Yeah. That's not an art practice. Being caustic is not an art practice. Exactly. But that was really cool. Oh, thank you, guys. I know we're we're kind of running low here, but uh, maybe just really quickly, I wonder. I mean, Pragita mentioned this, and I, I think that it's hugely important to me. I'm sure it's important to everybody, but ways that we can create like that kind of sense of community and trusting community more than anything like within the classroom like does are there ways that you guys try to do that not not like outside the classroom i mean are there strategies you have for creating like that kind of sense of like i don't know i i, I do i mean i try to do co-curricular activities with students right or even like go to lunch with students um and 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 not privilege them, like invite everybody and, and do things like that. Just so like, again, like Benita, like you were saying, like they're people and the more they see themselves outside of the classroom, like see each other outside of the classroom, the more they mean to each other, right? And they're less likely to to try to like get on each other's nerves or if they do, they know each other, um, right? I mean, you can still like, we get angriest at our family members, right? So they become a little bit more um, family-like in, in that way. So I don't know, um, I did, yeah, any suggestions for that? I haven't broken down that wall of um, kind of separation between professor and student that well. Sometimes they ask me, I'm like, you know, what did you do this weekend? And I'm sort of like, what do you want me to know this for? Why, 
what, <laughs> what is your intention? But we do have a really good, and you know, feeling of you know of camaraderie and all of that kind of stuff in the classroom. They know, and they know if they can ask me anything. We do have that, but we do have separate lives. I haven't integrated that. But, um, as well as others that have them, you know, um, cat sit and dog sit for them, and you know, all of those kinds of things are, are really cool. I'm a little bit envious of my of my peers that have those options. But also, one thing I did want to mention really fast is that I do set up for my, especially for my undergrads, I set up a few rules at the beginning of workshop that um, I think are really helpful, and I got these from from my uh, <laughs> from my first uh, creative writing teacher. And one of them is for sure, don't write about anybody else in the class. So that starts them to think about, you know, audience, to think about potentially being harmful to, and all that kind of stuff. Don't, no mean spiritedness. So don't actually come into the group, you know, with the intention of doing harm. So there's, you know, you start that kind of thing. And then no, no, there are all cow stories, meaning that <laughs> you're not writing about people, you're writing about um, some other kind of, you know, creature. And the big reveal at the end, the old Henry moment is that they're not, they're not actually in a fight getting divorced. They're just cows in the field, and it's, it's such a. <laughs> or they're just they're just fish in the bowl, and you know, like, what the heck did you do to me? Why did I read all these pages? And it was just all a lie. So it's that kind of stuff. So we have some, and there's like a couple more too, but I don't want to take up the rest of the time. But I think that does help them sort of bring themselves into the space, into the community, and start thinking about the audience more. Um, I, yeah, I was just thinking about um, what happens in the in the classroom with poetry is that I, I do remind them that many poets have come to poetry uh, to also be in community. So we are thinking about language together. We're writing together. We're we're engaged in a sociality of meaningful art making because so much of what has happened to poets is not necessarily through capitalist, you know, productivity. Um, so I do think that we're not always making a product um, and, and, and it is process oriented, but, but that we're thinking about each other with a lot of care and we're using language to do that. And that has happened for poets. Um, it's an intentional community. Um, so, so if we can spend that time together and be mindful of that, it's, it's, um, we make poems that way. That's so awesome. <laughs> and I try to create some kind of a forum in which the students can talk to each other outside of the classroom while they're making things. Because there's some people, I think, I know this, this takes the bodies away, which in some respects kind of turns it into like a social, social media situation. But I, I hope that it can do what Brigitte was talking about, where like, um, we're not just in this room together that is this thing where we're doing school and we're doing workshop, but we're a part of this like seven days a week community that has the opportunity to toss each other an encouraging YouTube or make like, oh, this is this is my favorite writing, like getting in a trance writing Spotify playlist or anybody else ever experienced this? I feel you, Vanita, you know, and then like, you know, so I, I require sometimes that everybody at the midweek point, like when we're farthest away from when we're going to meet in the classroom, we check in in some kind of online capacity and it's, a, it, it's innocuous or it's not, and it's not like, you know, comment once, reply twice or whatever. It's just, it's like a social media network for the make, for the maker space of the, of the thing, which is very fun. And I learn a lot about new music. So uh, that's always, always, and, and memes. I learn a lot about like what the, what, whatever the meme of the season is. That's fantastic. Oh, these are such great ideas. Um, I, I think we're, we're wrapping up then, but uh, Pragita, Elena, Benita, that was, that was wonderful. Um, so many great ideas. I can't wait to watch this recording, write down notes and then, you know, like, you know, incorporate all these into, into my classes and teaching. Um, um, thank you all. Uh, this is great. Um, I appreciate it. And maybe the recording is going to stop momentarily and we can still talk. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.